Good morning, everybody. Um, here we are in week 19 of ENM 2020. Uh, we have a star-studded cast of uh, of instructors to to talk about some of your questions. Um, why don't actually we've not done this before, but instructors, why don't we go around the room really quickly and just say who you are, where you work, and what what you've contributed because it's kind of a neat a neat set of people. Uh, Gonzalo, you want to start? Yeah, sure. So, well, uh, right now I am a I am Gonzalo Pinilla. I am a PhD student in the Anderson Lab in the City College of New York. And yes, actually, I am one of the lead developers of Wallace. Sarah? Hi, uh, I'm currently a postdoc at the Botanical Garden in Rio de Janeiro, and we work with uh, re re reproducibility in ecology and uh, ENM workflows. We were here for the one of the data cleaning uh, classes, and today we are presenting Wampler together with Andrea that gave the lecture. Marlon. Hi, my name is Marlon Cobos. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Towns Lab in KU, in the University of Kansas. And I'm here helping almost every week with the questions and answers. Mona. Hi everyone, my name is Mona Papesh. I'm an assistant professor uh, in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Tennessee. And I contributed, I think, two, two uh, talks, one on remote sensing and one on georeferencing. I tortured everyone about georeferencing. Um, and I joined these sessions because I like to learn from everyone present. Andrea. Hi everyone, I am Andrea Sanchez Tapia. I am a Colombian biologist. I am a, a postdoc at the Rio de Janeiro Botanical Garden too. I am one of the of the leader developers of Modular. And um, we work, as Sarah said, with a, a little bit of, of, of about niche modeling also, but we have a we have a course on uh, we teach R and we teach reproducibility. And we help uh, other other people in the garden, in the botanical garden, to do their, their analysis sometimes. And Jamie, not, last but not least. Hi, I'm Jamie Cass. I currently work at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University. And I am now working on mostly ants. I'm studying ant community temporal variability and we're also working on a global ant richness model. Um, I was also one of the lead developers of Wallace. Um, Gonzalo has uh, taken the helm for now, uh, but I'm still involved in the project. And, uh, oh, I also gave a presentation on data partitioning for the course as well. That was a lot of fun. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen and take us over to the, uh, I can never get this damn thing out of the way. There we go. So course plan, we're in the thick of it now. Um, for next week, we have um, a presentation on SDM from Babak Naimi and then five presentations on Biomod from Wilfried Tweeler and his group. Uh, so it'll be a busy week next week. And here we are in the questions. Um, anybody have a question they really wanna take on? I, I, if I can start, I, I just want to, like, not, it's not a comment about any specific question, okay. but we, we got uh, some questions that still ask for the specifics, uh, for the specific best approach uh, that would serve any case. And, uh, and, um, and the, the, the first message that we would like to convey is that nothing that has been discussed earlier during the course 
uh, everything holds. So, so there is not, not always like these kind of questions that ask for the specifics. Uh, they do not disappear just because there are platforms that facilitate approaches. So, so maybe uh, just a message to, to, to go back to the whole course and to go back to the questions and to the approaches and to go back to the, to the specific research question that you have at hand. Uh, that, does, that should not conflict with the fact that there are some platforms that are facilitating things for you. So that's... I think that's a good general point that, you know, very, very frequently in these courses, and, you know, remembering that there are a lot of people out there who are using this course as a way of just beginning. So, you know, we got to take into account the fact that some people are really, really new to this. But people really want the answer or the recipe. And the answer is there is no recipe. Um, these are complex analyses and they require complex approaches to them. The different platforms, and you're gonna hear about a ton of different platforms uh, for developing these, these analyses. The different platforms do different things or they do the same things in different ways. For example, um, we heard from Corey Merrow about, about Maxent and we saw some of the, the Maxent GUI interface. Well, Wallace is using Maxent, um, KUENM is based on Maxent. It's all on the same engine but they do different things. And probably each one of them has, has different advantages and disadvantages. And I think one of the biggest lessons, if we can pass on anything to the, the beginning scientists out there who are paying attention to this course is you have to get in and experiment. There is no recipe. Uh, now again, different platforms are, are stronger in different things. For example, Modeler is very strong in comparisons among algorithms. Whereas, for example, KUENM is way deeper as far as getting into exploring one algorithm and getting the parameterization done um, quite, quite precisely. Wallace is a broader platform. So I think, I think it's, it's kind of on you as the user to get in there and really play and do your best to put your data into the framework of a bunch of these, these platforms and see what you learn from each one. Mm -hmm. Okay, specific questions, other comments? I mean, just related to this comment, there's a question here that is about, uh, uh, is it is possible to build an application which needs to know only the species name to build a model or models. And I think this is, is, is really on the opposite of what we are trying to do. Like we are trying to automatize process, but at every step we need to evaluate. First of all, we need to have a question and theoretical background to, to, to begin with, but it is not possible to give species names and end up with models and publish this and do whatever, even if, if you're not publishing. So let's just take a step back and, and think of the questions and what is the platform that it suits better to answer your question. And there's another point here with the familiar, familiarity that you have with the platform. So with, there are a lot of our packages. So seems like it's a good thing to start learning R, but there are other options too. So it, it really depends on your question and what the platform can do and, and what are you, are you willing to do? Right. I'd also like to emphasize that with a lot of the questions, it, it seems like people are, are focusing more on the features of the packages, saying, what can the package do? What can this package do? Can this package do the same thing? Um, I would encourage people to, to concentrate on, on their study and their system. 
think of the questions first that you want to answer with your system, then you find the tools that can answer those questions. It should be that, that process, that sequence of, of, uh, of thoughts. What does your question require in terms of analyses? Right. Well, you know, maybe for this one, I need a model transfer. Okay, so which, which platforms are helping me with model transfer? Maybe in one, I need um, geographic data at, at different resolutions. Okay, how can I solve that problem? I think it's worth it's worth emphasizing, you know, good data analysis involves a lot of playing, a lot of visualization, a lot of exploration, and probably a lot of saying, well, I tried this, it didn't work for me as well as this other thing. Um, and that may be individual analyses or it may be a whole platform. But yeah, as Jamie said, you know, figure out what your question requires and then figure out where are the particular tools that you need in order to to get those things that you need and that may involve several platforms it may involve individual tools it may involve you know this this kind of ridiculously diverse toolkit or it may be something that you can just put all in in r and and provide people with a nice um, set of code to do all of your analysis. Now, is it gonna, is it gonna simplify to the level of typing in the species name? Dumb idea. If you've, been, if you've been paying attention in this course in the 19 weeks that we've done so far, please remember diverse data sets, please remember data quality, please remember data cleaning, Please remember all of the customized, detailed, careful details that we need to take care of to make these models more than just a, you know, a quick environmental matching for a bunch of points. It might be a good exercise to make a, a new package where you can literally type a species name and press enter and it will just choose a random model with random parameters and just give you something. It might be educational to show people <laughs> what you can get. <laughs> well, GBIF had a quick bioclim model uh, implemented. It, it stayed up there for a year or two. But my feeling is that feature did more to detract from GBIF in its early years. Because typically what would happen was, you know, the world expert in some taxon would type in the species name, see a bunch of data, but then down at the bottom there was this thing that said, create your bioclim ecological niche model. And the expert would click on that link and then just absolutely melt down and say, this is bullshit, I've never seen a worse model. Look at that, there's a point on the wrong continent. Look at that, there's a point in the ocean. The map looks horrible. And you know, a bunch of us said to, to GBIF, please, for the love of God, take that thing off of there. <laughs> and finally, I don't know if it was because of our comments or, or because of comments they received or what, but, but it finally disappeared to the, to the benefit of everybody. Specific questions? I just wanted to add a little, a little bit more to that, to what we were discussing. Uh, remember that we are doing modeling exercises and as models there's no right answer there's not at least there's not just one right answer and even your final product can have different uh, options like in, that you can present there's not just one best thing that you can obtain so it's also uh, important to remember that when you're doing or using the same things not you don't have to create one good thing from everything you do but you you can also present those different views of the models you are creating so and that's that's important because it's showing how viable your your work your results can be so 
uh, I think that's also important to remember whenever you're doing a model or whenever you're deciding whether to use one or the other tool. So, Regarding Amy questions. and Gonzalo, there seems to be a repeat question, which is Wallace yeah. version two when? This is this is for Gonzalo. <laughs> so well, right now I think that we will have a beta version for Wallace version two at the end of July. So yes, if the people want to test this this version, we will release a message in the, our Google group. So yeah, we know when a beta version is ready. There's also one question that asked, will version two be free? Yeah. I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, all the tools in this course are free. Yeah, and will, will remain free. No one's profiting off of these directly. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I'll admit that there is some things that have been taught based on use of ARC. And so ARC is a commercial program. Uh, but yeah, we, we really have made a conscious and deliberate effort to focus on tools that are free and open. So for example, Climax, interesting kind of climate matching tool that has some mechanistic modeling dimensions to it, um, but has long been for pay. And so, no, it's not in here. Other questions? There is a quick short one on line 2277. Okay. Um, it's about Wallace. When using Wallace, how do we know which environmental variable contributes the most to explain the data of our model? And I think that's related to Mac having that kind of output from Maxent or that kind of information from Maxent. And I don't know the answer. <laughs> okay, on Wallace. I think that's not possible. I think that you can, we, right now you can get the lambdas table and you at least will know which variables are contributing to your model, but it's impossible to have like the percentage of contribution. It's not available right now. If I think it's because this mo, this mo package is not doing that. So, so the, technically it's impossible to get this. No, but well, the, you can get it from the maxent.jar software, but you can't get okay. it from maxnet. Okay. Yet, um, I think Stephen might be working on that to implement more of the Java features into MaxNet, which is the R implementation. But um, yeah, the, the other complicated thing is that there are two variable importance metrics for MaxNet: one which is deterministic and one which is not. So percent contribution, which sounds like the one you want, is actually not deterministic. Every time you run it, you get different answers. Um, and uh, what's it called? Permutation importance is the one that does not change no matter how many times you run it. That's usually the one that you want when you uh, are looking for variable importance. Another problem is, is that the explanations of what those mean exist nowhere in the literature and only in the brief tutorial uh, of Maxent old version that is actually not online anymore. <laughs> We're working on getting it back into the new version that is on the uh, American Museum website. That will happen quite soon. Um, but yeah, it's actually a, a complicated answer. Um, hopefully, hopefully that information will be up and available um, uh, again soon. And it, it's actually an, an interesting thing to contemplate as well, because a lot of algorithms have some sort of variable importance measure built into them. But if you think about the Hutchinsonian duality, sometimes a variable that contributes to the model actually has very small geographic implications. And so, you know, this is another thing where, hey, just get in and play with your models. You know, if, if, if a, a variable looks really important, you know, let's say, I don't know, maximum temperature of the, of the hottest month, maybe that just jumps out as a really important variable. Well, once you have that result, try developing another model that leaves that variable out, but has everything else the same. Same parameter settings, same other variables, all that, 
and just ask yourself, how much did it change? You know, it's not necessarily stuff that we put in the methods or that we put in the final set of figures when we publish a paper, but it really teaches you a lot about what it is you're doing when you, you know, include the 19 bioclimatic variables or when you reduce to those that are uncorrelated or when you do a principal components transformation, whatever, you got to learn about these things and learn about what you're doing and what are the implications of what you're doing. So, you know, take the time to explore. This gets complicated because uh, oftentimes you're told if you're using machine learning algorithms, you don't need to worry about uh, collinearity. Um, you can toss them all in and the algorithm will figure it out. Um, that's, uh, there's some truth to that, but w when you're talking about interpretation, that's where it gets, it gets tricky because um, the variables that are correlated, um, one of them might jump out as the, the important one that the model chooses, whereas the other one's tossed out and which one gets tossed out is kind of a random process. And so you might get the same model, but it chooses a different variable each time. And okay. so um, if you're looking to interpret what uh, uh, your, uh, which variables get retained and which are the most important, it is still important to do collinearity tests and, and, and toss out variables that are correlated. But it's also important to try multiple iterations like, like Town just said. I I think uh, that there's something, I don't know, yes, <laughs> my Nick. Uh, there's, there's a lot going um, behind the scenes when, when something is published as a final model. There's a lot of testing and there's a lot of iterations going on. There's a lot of decision making. And, and um, I think one of, one, of the, one of the things that we try to do by, by setting different folders and, and by setting the options for parametrization is, is uh, bringing something of this behind the scenes part where you are testing and, and seeing how it works, what are the differences between the outputs, just to control a little part of this variation, to, to try to focus on the, on the effect of what you are changing. That, that usually was performed uh, by trial and error uh, behind the scenes and it, and it occupied lots of uh, code that does not get eventually to publication, but but uh, that 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 a l large amount of work is still needed for everyone. So so you have to have a, a platform or or a way, or to find yourself a way where this kind of experimentation gets easy for you. So you can take decisions by 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 fixing some of the variations. So I think this is part of one of the things that that. Th that's that's one of the reasons where some things are implemented not to be used at the end but to be able to experiment to, to make this kind of comparison well, we have quite a, a thunderstorm breaking out here so i hope that my internet holds up and <laughs> ireland's as well it's typhoon season here, so. Yeah. <laughs> At least you get a little more warning with those. <laughs> um, I highlighted this one because it had an interesting, uh, the number two was interesting, like, uh, it, it basically asking, is asking, what does Wallace do to, to clean data? And then how do I use this user specified option correctly? And so uh, Wallace does do some internal, very, very basic cleaning, like removing duplicate points. Um, and you can also do spatial thinning with SP thin, but there are instances where that's not enough and you need to do some manual thinning or use a different package to do some cleaning. And so, yes, that's where you would download GBIF data, do something with Wallace, take it out, do something else, and then put it back. And when you put it back, you'd use the user specified and then continue the analysis. I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, we, we have that too. The data cleaning that is implemented in Modeler is very basic. It's just, just to, to, to check that the, the output was good correctly. I think I forgot to say in the lecture that, that we can get also troop absences if, if the user has them. So in spite of having options for pseudo absence sampling, we have the option user-defined parameters that that is the ideal 
option, but, but yes, um, having user-defined options is very, the, the usual, the ideal, so data cleaning gets performed and, and, the, and the thinking before gets um, done. I think very generally, you know, we, we spent several weeks on data cleaning um, and we saw semi-automated approaches to data cleaning um, and we saw hand approaches to data cleaning. My personal feeling is if you don't go through your data set point by point, then you've certainly got some extra noise in your data set. I, I think that the point is that even if you do automize the process, you still have to check. It doesn't, it doesn't, automatizing the process doesn't mean that you need, to, you don't need to check at every step. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, the automation can help. Mm -hmm. And there are some things that are obvious, like, you know, thinning your data so you're not um, oversampling or overemphasizing mm -hmm particular areas, but um, there, there are some data cleaning tools that can, um, that can really help you with flagging potential problems, which you then need to go in and look at by hand. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been talking a little bit about when, I, when this course is over, and when I've forgotten how much work it is, coming back around and doing a, a really serious data cleaning course. Um, it's something that we did very, very early in the biodiversity informatics training curriculum. And it was probably the worst course that we did uh, for a bunch of reasons. And so I really would like to come back around to it and um, ask, you know, what are the, automated tools, what are the semi-automated tools, what are some recipes that we can implement by hand and that people smarter than me could probably turn into tools, and then what should we be doing just as, in terms of you know, playing with data so that we understand where the little problems are. Again, it'll take a little bit of amnesia so that I can uh, remember what it's like to have Fridays and Saturdays free of processing videos, getting ready, getting ready for the next Monday. Other questions? Two, 2,333. These numbers are getting big. They are. There we go. This may be a silly question, but the more you know about ENM, the more complex it gets. And together with the amount of software av available, it can be a bit overwhelming for beginners. So as a simple question, how can we decide which software is better for our data or our purposes? For example, how do we decide if we're going to use Maxent or this Wallace application? Yeah, so I think we addressed the first part, like how do you decide um, Basically, uh, you know, we, we can't tell you, and that's the hard part. You need to <laughs> explore the features of them and, and figure out what the best fit is. And a lot of them do similar things, but a lot of them, um, all of them have uh, features that the others don't have. And so it's important to look at them. But what, what I wanted to emphasize is that, uh, at least for this week, the, these, these software packages are not algorithms. They, they use, existing algorithms, they're basically workflows. So they, they help you with a workflow. And so there's a big distinction between a modeling algorithm and then a package um, like, like Wallace or Modeler or, or BioClim that, 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 harn that harnesses those algorithms and, and does some kind of workflow for you or, or iterates models like ENM eval or something like that. So th yeah, there's a, there's a distinction that needs to be made. And and another point is, you know, each of these workflows or platforms has different features. Uh, for example, um, you know, Modeler brings in a bunch of different algorithms. And you're going to hear about Biomod next week. Again, a bunch of different algorithms. Yes. Whereas, you know, 
Wallace and KUNM are both max up. So um, kind of one interesting exercise, and I don't know that it's been done, or at least I don't know that it's been done and shared. An interesting exercise would be to compile a list of these of these platforms and then kind of create a matrix of functionalities. Uh, which does what? It's, and, it's been done. Yeah, it's been done. I have seen. Okay. Well, if you know where, um, send me the link and I'll put it on, on the course page. Unfortunately, I think it's not fair for all, all tools. Well, uh, I think they didn't do a well exploration. I think there, there have been many initiatives to begin with the list and some, somewhere in the middle of the process, there are so many things that the person just thinks it's that's why, that's why every, all the authors need to get together, write a paper together and they can choose how to characterize their own package. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that's I'm very happy to the, be involved with that. Probably the fairest way to do it because that way it's the expert on each of the platforms. And in fact, given that we've got three platforms represented here, if anybody wants to do that, um, the journal Biodiversity Informatics will uh, fast track publishing it for you. <laughs> I, I, will mention, awesome. I will mention Blas Benito, who tried to do that uh, a couple months ago. And, uh, and uh, well, things have been hectic, I guess, this, this month. So, so there was, yes, a, a couple <clears throat> initiatives to make that list. And uh, I, I want to, I want to, to re-emphasize what, what Jamie said. These are not algorithms, these are workflows. And, and, and um, uh, sometimes we, we, what we wanted to say also during our talk is that we should use each other too. Like the best workflow will come from communication between us and between all tools. And sometimes when we are developing these platforms, we, we have to take the decision of whether implementing them inside of our workflows or letting them uh, apart. And, and we don't need to make a package that, use, that implements everything that, is, that exists. It's impossible to do. It's time consuming. And, and there are so many teams doing great work that you shouldn't like, try to put inside your own workflow is going to be harder than, than communicating. So, so, so for example, we had this question about uh, KUENM partial rock implementation. And we did implement that, for example, we, the decision was to put uh, this partial rock inside because we wanted this in our tables. But for example, uh, occurrence thinning by SP thin is, is wrapped enough that we, we we have no reason to to not communicate with them so so we don't we didn't take it into the workflow we we hope that the user will and and that and that we we will somehow communicate and that that's the best uh, balance between package writing and and uh, communication between all of us yeah and <clears throat> about the complexity that i mentioned here yes it is true uh, ecological niche modeling, spatial distribution modeling, it's become more and more uh, co a complex task uh, because it needs to be like that. And for beginners, it's true, it's, it can be complicated, but that's precisely the kind of the goal of this or the motivation for this kind of courses to let you know about all the stuff and to like, let the experts talk about every topic so they explain you better uh, and i think uh, it's it's been working it's been a lot more clear to hear a presentation from someone that has been working in a specific topic for several years than just reading the paper and i think i hope that this is helping to beginners to realize the complexity but also to make notes in each of the points that you need to take care of when you're doing an ecological niche modeling. And yes, it's not anymore a task for one day of processing. It could be weeks or even months. And that's fair, that's how it needs to be. Uh, as, as kind of the, the elder member of this group, 
um, you know, 20 years ago, there really wasn't a community of people who were thinking about this in incredible detail. And now there are hundreds of people who are thinking creatively and usefully about these techniques. 20 years ago, you know, you could do a single model run and do something useful with it. Mona will remember when she was a doctoral student that she and I set out to do a one day start to finish paper. And I think we did end up um, doing some work in the second day, but the paper was published. It was a pretty minor publication, um, but it was doable back then. And it really it was doable because we didn't have the sophistication of methods that we have now. And now, you know, 15, 20 years later, what we as a community, which is to say everybody who has been an instructor in this course and a lot of other people, what we as a community have done is to think about every little detail. What are the sources of bias? What are the sources of, of strength or weakness in a, in a particular result? And because of that, we have a lot of kind of cautions and precautions and, and little fixes that we need to do. And we have uh, a lot of tools that have been developed that do different things differently. Um, and yeah, it takes time now. So, you know, in, in my lab, where Marlon is right now, we, we um, decided to take on modeling a new invasive insect in North America. And, you know, there are six or eight really, really smart people who've done a lot of these models, a lot of these different steps. And the, you know, about three weeks ago, Jorge Soberon said, okay, We've got this Tuesday morning. I want all of this on my desk and we write the paper. And it's two or three weeks later and we're still not done. And this is with all the computing resources that you need and all the troubleshooting. I mean, it's within kind of the KUENM framework. Um, but, you know, we should be able to do this as fast as anybody and it's still taking weeks. Yeah, we're, we're almost done and we're gonna start writing the paper and you know, wrap up the last details and such, but it's not something that is simple anymore. You know, Mona and you know, Rob Anderson, Jamie's and Gonzalo's academic dad, Mona and Rob enjoyed a little bit of that easy and simple era, or you know, Marines who is a, an advisor for Andrea and Sara. You know, it, it, was, it was simpler back then just because there wasn't the sophistication of tools. Just two, two additions to that. One, it was simpler because, because we didn't have sophistication, but it was harder because we did not have, you know, the GBIF and the, you know, access to data was much more difficult when I started in 2001. But... Um, what I'm so, I'm very surprised when I teach, you know, uh, here, uh, I'm very surprised that most graduate students really just want to push the button. They don't, they don't, they, you know, I have to drag them <laughs> kicking and screaming through the th uh, theory and I get, you know, my reviews are, oh, the class became much more interesting when we finally started to run models. And so people really just want to see the map, the potential distribution and, you know, plaster that into a paper. And so I guess to some degree, they want to do what we did 20 years ago, or I shouldn't say 20, maybe 19 or 18. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Not that old, Mona, come on. <laughs> I can't believe it's been so many years. But yeah, I, I wonder why, why on average, uh, people who join the field are not that interested in getting understanding what they are doing. They just want a fast result. And I, I'm not sure why, why, why that mentality. 
but I think that's that's common across all kind of sophisticated analyses. You know, we definitely see it in phylogenetics, where you know, in my career, I saw the transition from you know counting character transitions by hand on a tree to you know computer-based optimization for parsimony to model-based um, optimizations. And even so, you know, 30 years later, you still see people trying to use neighbor joining trees. And, you know, neighbor joining trees were a bad idea when I was in graduate school. And yet people still do it. Or multivariate statistics. You know, if you really know what you're talking about with multivariate statistics and you see what people do in the literature, you have nightmares. Yeah, I think that this is a uh, recurrent problem in several areas that the tool is, is more important than the theory behind it. And I think that that's what this course is trying to make the point that you, do, you don't do anything without understanding theory and having really good questions. But I think there's also, it's like, a, like a, um, maybe it's a natural thing, the infatuation of the maps. I, I felt that. I, 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 I am sure that the happiest part and, and, and my mind keeps uh, popping questions and conclusions well, well in, before I have checked the model. So, so we, we produce uh, lots of models because we, we don't have now the, this computational limitation. And, and, the, and in the modeler um, framework, we tend to parallelizations and kind of mm, semi-massive things. But still, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't impede that we have to check things after, after that. But, but, but still, the, 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 the tendency, the natural tendency, is to, is to like the maps, to believe in them. So, so, so maybe that's just part of the approach where our brains, I don't know, primate thing. It's like, ah, oh, yes. And, and, and you kind of, uh, your mind starts um, pulling uh, way ahead uh, into conclusions, way before you should be doing that. So maybe it's, uh, to, it's a call to control this kind of uh, instinct of look, go, liking maps, basically, liking figures that are nice. So, so we should uh, um, uh, slow our, our reactions regarding that. We published a book in 2011 on, on niches and distributions um, amongst seven of us. And the reviews were, you know, as, as should be expected, mixed um, two of the reviews literally i kid you not this is going back to sarah's comment two of the reviews said very useful book but those initial chapters presenting <gasps> the concepts and all of those equations just they were a waste of time what do we need that for and my feeling is and i've, I've argued this with soberone recently the only useful part of that book are the initial chapters. And so, you know, we've from time to time talked about a, a second edition of the book or coming back around to it. And what I think we both agree on is get rid of all of the applications and get rid of all of the empirical stuff, you know, how to, and just put out a conceptual framework for distributional ecology rather than a how-to or a cookbook. Anyhow, I'm and, and, I, and I, just the final point, and I, I understand that this can be disappointing if people are here, I, I just, I'm here just for a recipe. Please tell me the recipe. And okay, the lesson here is that we don't have a recipe. And 19 weeks. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and you won't have a recipe yeah. by the end of the course. So, <laughs> spoiler alert: you don't have a recipe. Exactly. the The, the movie ends badly for you. <laughs>
I'm afraid I have another meeting coming up in a few minutes, so I'm going to I'm going to cut off the uh, question and answer. But thanks everybody uh, amongst the instructors for showing up and for um, having such a good and rich discussion. And next week is biomod and SDM, so stay tuned.